Let's turn our Bibles to Numbers, chapter 13, verse 25. Numbers, chapter 13, verse 25. At the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. And they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, We came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anas there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negev, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the hill country, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well and able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought the people of Israel a bad report from the land that they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim, and we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seem to them. Numbers chapter 14, verse 6. And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Nephunas, who were among those who had spied out the land, they tore their clothes, and said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, The land which we passed through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, He will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Then all the congregation said to stone them with stones. But the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the people of Israel. Let's pray. Lord, as we gather together and as we listen to your word, there are so many things in this world that we become afraid of, that our hearts are captured by fear and things are God that easily entangle us and we begin to doubt the reality of who you are. And so we pray that through your word, that through our time in it, that you would begin to transform us to be a people who are no longer afraid and living in fear of everything. We pray that you would set your people free by the truth and you would remind us again that you are God and that you love us. And so we pray all of this in your name. Amen. What makes some people dive into fear when other people run away from the same fear? Why is it that some people run into the things that other people are afraid of and run far, far away from? How is it that people who have their hearts ripped out, and I have read accounts of these people who have been betrayed so deeply, so deeply in their souls by the people that they trusted the most, how is it that such people heal and begin to approach another relationship after their hearts have been ripped out? How is it that people who have been abused by the people who are supposed to love them the most, their parents, can go back and love people. It's a question that we must ask, why is it that there are people who will take their fears and go after it and pursue it, and other people just run and run and run as far as they can? What makes people dive in? Isn't it true that we're all fragile and broken and that the challenges of what is before 
before us, the fear, it's real, it's true. It's not something that you can make up in your head and go, you know what, I'm not really that afraid. How many people can stand before a lion that is hungry and be like, yeah, I'm not really afraid, I'm just feeling things. No. When we stand before a lion, you're like, actually afraid, because that animal can actually eat you. And so there is a reality to the fear. Why would anyone rise against the norm when it will make your life uncomfortable? When everything around you says, just go with the flow, do what everyone else is doing, all your friends are doing, and you can be comfortable. Why would you rise up and say, no, I'm going to challenge it, and I'm going to make my life hell? Because it's in a hell that we're avoiding. Isn't it the reason why many people become Christian? Because you don't want to go to hell, and you don't want to end up suffering, and so you avoid it at all say, if Jesus is the way, then I will take that ticket. Because we don't want to be discomforted. But why is it that people die into the most discomforting things, even facing the fears that paralyze them? Why challenge the system? Why did Abraham Lincoln shake up the entire country to set up people free? Why did William Wilberforce in England do the same, living every day, being tortured by all of his friends who are, are you kidding me, our entire economy runs in the slavery system. And William Wilberforce kept fighting it and fighting it, and then his friends would laugh at him as he would bring it up. Again, William, are you going to never stop bringing this up? You know that our economy will crash if we do this. And he would say again and again, how can you? Take the life and the freedom of the people for granted. How can I not live the rest of my life challenging that which is so wrong? Why would you face fears? One of my favorite scenes in a movie is, uh, well, one of my favorite scenes is uh, uh, Forrest Gump. It's like top 10 in my movie list. And one of the things that I loved was how simply amazing Forrest Gump is, in the way that it was simple in his love. And I remember when he was fighting in the Vietnam War and he got shot. Right? He went and he was trying to figure out where Bubba is and he got shot. And he was carrying some guy and then he said, ah, something bit me in my butt. And then he said, he realized that what bit him in the butt was a bullet. Right? So someone shot him in the butt and he had a bullet lodged in his butt. But he was like, ah. And he dropped the one guy as he was looking for Bubba. And then he would go across and he would find another guy with his like eye blown up. And he would carry that guy. And he's like, Bubba! Bubba, where are you? And he would bring that guy back. And then he would go back for Bubba. And then there would, he would see another guy. And he was like, man, so many people. And he would pick up another guy and bring him back. And you know, missiles are blowing up and the airplanes come to destroy everything. And he's just like, Bubba! Bubba! And Bubba, he finally finds. And Bubba is like all shot up and he's going to die. But he's like, Bubba? And he carries him on his shoulder and he goes back. And I remember again and again the conversations that Forrest and Bubba had. Shrimp cocktail, shrimp this, shrimp burger, right? And he just kept going on. And these are like the most mundane things. But here's the truth. What made Forrest Gump go into a firefight, to bombs, to even risk his life. Because those were real. Things were blowing up. He was getting bit in the butt by bullets. What made him go into that fire against the fear of other people? Everyone else would run away because you could die. What made Forrest run into it? Because there was a greater reality than even his death. His love for Bubba carried him all the way. There's a famous quote that Scott posted by William Wallace, another one of my favorite movies, right? Every man dies, but not every man truly lives. If you are pushed around by fear, if you're always afraid of what your boss is going to think, if you're always afraid that you're not good enough to accomplish a task that is far greater than you, if you believe that you are captured by whatever comforts and whatever things you fear losing or whatever it is that you're afraid of, then at the end of your life, you may be afraid that you're not going to get married. You're afraid that you're not going to get the job that you want. You're afraid that you don't look as good as other people. You're afraid that maybe you can't have children. Maybe 
everything in life, you live by fear that there is something that controls you. And so you're captured by fear and the reality of fear. Every man, truly, every woman in this place, one time or another, you will die. But not every single one of you in this room will truly ever live. Because you will be pushed around and you will be captured by fear more than the gift and the blessing of life that God gives to us. I believe that the Bible speaks of something that casts out this fear. It doesn't mean that you aren't afraid like the rest of the people around you, your friends and the people around. You are seen exactly afraid of the same thing. You ask the same question. There's a part of me that always says, what if, what if I can't do that? And what if I'm not strong enough? What if no one loves me? What if you will ask the same questions and your heart will say the same things? And yet there are those who will go beyond those things. What that means is that there has to be something that is greater than even the cost of losing your life and the possibility of suffering, maybe even for the rest of your life, and even the cost of being hated by everyone. Something that is so greater than the fears and all these costs. And that reality is so great that you would be willing to go against everything. What makes the firefighters charge into a burning building when everyone else runs away from the burning building. As Joshua and Caleb came back and as they spied out the land, they brought, and this is what they brought back, they brought back two people carrying on their shoulders grapes that are so big that you, one cluster, it says, one cluster of grapes that is so big and so large that they couldn't carry it with their hand. Our grapes now, you can throw it, you can carry it. The grape, they have to carry it on a stick on the shoulder. And then they came back. It was so great. The land was so powerful. And everyone was like, let's go in. Joshua and Caleb looked at each other and said, let's go. God gave us this land. The land is plenty. The land is full. Let's go and take it. Then the ten other spies that were right there were like, heck no. We're not going in there. They were saying these people of Anak, which were descendants of Nephilim, they were tall. They were like eight feet, seven feet tall. They were giants. And they said, we look like grasshoppers in front of them. You go into that place and you're going to get killed. And so once they started speaking, the ten of them, and they started talking about how big they are, how big and strong the walls were, what ended up happening was everybody, all the Israelites started saying, oh, we can't go there. Just a few minutes before when Joshua said, look at what is ours. I'm sure they were excited. Man, look at those grapes. But as soon as they said giants, they were like, oh, oh, no, no, no. And so everyone backed up. Joshua and Caleb stood before the people, and this is what you do when you're so frustrated, so angry, you're so upset that the injustice going on, that the people of Israel used to tear their clothes. They, they didn't know what else to do, so they're like, ah! And they tore their clothes, and they're like, how can you do this? How can you reject God? People were afraid. They had fear and suffering, and they had these giants and everything that was causing their heart to believe that they weren't good enough, they were too small, unarmed, that they weren't powerful enough to conquer that fear. Let me read to you 1 John chapter 4, which is one of my favorite, favorite sections of the Bible. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 says this: by this is love perfected with us. That's what you want, isn't it? When you are afraid, you want love to perfect your heart. So that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as He is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love, we love 
because he first loved us. What does the Bible speak of fear? How can people look at the face of fear and everything in their soul that tells them that they cannot do it, other people cannot do it, that when they're facing the giants in life and all the things that they've been hurt by and broken over, how can they stand, look at it, and then conquer it? How can they get other people to believe? And the Bible clearly speaks, and Jesus says, you will have confidence when love casts out fear. Know this, that I sent my only son, that he is going to die, that he is going to be on the cross, and having him to be the one that I pour out my wrath to, that I even face that grave thing for you. And then Jesus, looking upon the cross and what he would have to pay for our salvation, why did he go to the cross? And it says this, Jesus looked upon the cross and when he looked upon the cross for the joy set before him, he endured the shame of the cross. Why? Why are we able to overcome the fear that is so real in front of us when you know that there is a love that conquers that fear. When you know that there is a greater reality of love, then you're able to look at the fear and look at the cost and say that there is something far greater that I am not willing to risk. Because when you are captured by fear and when you surrender to fear, you forfeit love. I'm going to say that again. When you let fear capture your heart, when you let fear determine how you're going to live your life, you're afraid that you can't get a job, you're afraid that you won't be loved, you're afraid that no one likes you, you're afraid that if you're weird that no one's going to stand by you. When you're afraid and you're captured by fear, then you know that love and fear cannot exist in the same place. And so the Bible says, will you let love reign or will you let fear reign? Because it cannot be one and the same. But perfect love casts out fear. It's not the love of men because love of men will never be perfect. Your friend, all the people you've ever grown up with, I remember in high school everyone wrote on my yearbook and they said, we will be friends forever, BFF forever. They wrote their number. I still have the yearbooks. I look at some of that and I'm like, I don't know who these people are. Incomplete, non-perfect love from men, women, sororities, fraternities, from all the things that people say will last forever. It will never get rid of fear because it is not perfect love because it is always changing. You think a husband and a wife and your children that they will secure fear. I remember a pastor standing and he was sharing about the love that he had for his daughter. The immense love and everything he did for her and he stood up and said that his daughter walked up to him one day and he, she looked at him in the eye and said, you and I, we're done. Don't call me, don't ask me about anything. I just don't want you in my life. And she walked away and he said that he didn't even know why. And he said for years he wept. For years he would be in his study reading the word and he couldn't understand why his daughter had left and he would rip his soul before God and he would say, why, why? Because you see, you can rely on a child's love or a spouse's love or a friend's love, but their love isn't perfect because when it endangers their comfort, when it endangers their joy, and they cannot but abandon you to save themselves. But upon the cross, you see a perfect love that never abandoned you for his comfort. Perfect love casts out fear because you never have to doubt that it's going to change. Because you are not good enough. Because you haven't read the Bible enough. Because you haven't come to church enough. There is never anything that you can 
can do to make God love you less, and there is nothing you can do to make God love you more. It's perfect because it is not dependent on us. It's perfect because it has nothing to do with what we can offer. And so he says, only perfect love can cast out fear. So will you look for another man to satisfy another woman? Will you look for another job to make your life complete? It is imperfect love that will always break your heart. But God invites us to say, perfect love, my love, casts out fear. And so it is with Joshua and Caleb. And you wonder, what happened to Joshua that he stood in front of these millions of people and said, let's go in. When everyone else would run from the burning building and the giants that are about to kill him, what made him say, let's go? Sure, we can be killed. Sure, things can be devastated. But let's go in there. The answer is found in Exodus chapter 33, verse 11. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face. There was a man, a long time ago named Moses, who would talk to God with such intimacy that literally his presence would be seen in a cloud and then God described it as talking to a friend face to face. This is what I long for. When I'm reading the Bible, I'm like, God, how come, how come you're not talking to me like Moses? I want my office to be like full of smoke. And I want you to sit and I want you to just, just whisper like good stuff and I want to know. And he's like, I know, I put it in the Bible and I read it. And so I read it. And as Moses would go in and talk to God face to face, as man speaks to his friend, it says, when Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. This is the only thing that talks about Joshua when he was younger. The only thing that it said was that when Moses would talk to God face to face, Joshua, this little Young man would sit at the camp right next to the tent and he would just sit there. And when Moses was done and he would go and tell the people, you're sinning and we need to do this and that, Joshua wouldn't go with even Moses, but he sat at the presence of God's tent and he would just love it. He would dwell and he would enjoy God. Joshua didn't want Moses to be his idol or superhero. Joshua sat and he would be the one young man when God's presence would come, he would sit by the tent because he knew that was where God would be. And even after the superhero left for everyone else, he would know that he's not the real thing, but God himself is the real thing. And so he would sit alone and he would enjoy the presence of God. And when Joshua would grow up, he would become the servant who would replace Moses. <clears throat> the question you have to answer when your life is full of fear is this, is the presence of God a greater reality than your fears? Because for many of you, the fear of not being loved, the fear of not being good enough, the fear of not having the right job and being loved by your family, the fears that strike at your heart is a greater reality than the presence of God. For Joshua, when he saw the giants, he didn't see the giants. He, he knew the fears that they could die. But the greater reality than the fears that were natural, <coughs> the greater reality that he loved more than anything else was the presence of God. And I'm asking, and I'm pleading, is that the reality that is greater than everything else in this life? Greater than your friends who calls you in the middle of the day and says, hey, let's go get something to eat? Is there a part of you that says, no, my friends calling me out, my friends eating late at night, me getting a college degree, me facing the fact that maybe I'll be single for the rest of my life, so many fears that exist, I'm asking, is the presence of God more real and more precious 
than the fears that strike at your heart. Because until it's more precious and more real, you will never be able to face all the fears that exist in this world. Because those things will control your heart. What if my best friend leaves me? What if I don't graduate? What if I don't get into the right school? What if, what if my parents pass away? What if, whatever it is that you love, whatever it is that is most important to you, there is always fear attached because you don't want to lose it. And unless the presence of God is greater than that, then you will always live a life of fear that runs from these things. There's a story in the Bible of two sisters. And this one sister named Martha, she was always busy. You know the A types, the people who are very busy body, they're always like cooking and doing stuff and they always want to do stuff for people. You know, and things like that. Martha was like that. She was always creating, loving, and serving and all that kind of stuff. And the weird thing was, Martha's little sister, Mary, was maybe like just emotional. Maybe she didn't serve that much. And one time when Jesus was over, Mary was sitting right next to Jesus' feet, it says, and just, she was in love. She just sat by Jesus' feet and she was staring. And whatever Jesus said, she was like, oh, that's so good, and tears, and like, ah. Oh. And then Martha was serving, and then Martha got mad. You know, older sister, right? Some, some of you guys are old. Mary, what are you doing? Why aren't you doing anything? What's wrong with you? Martha was busy loving Christ, but in her heart she was serving and she was doing all these things. And in her mind, as she was serving, she would look at Mary and be like, oh, if you really love Jesus, you'd like help me and you'd serve and you'd clean and you'd do something. Stop staring at Jesus' face. And in her head, she must boil over and it got so much that she looked and went to Jesus himself and said, can you tell her to come and help me? And Jesus looked at her and said, I'm only here with you for a short time. Serving is good and all this stuff, but what she is doing, that is better. Because you can get lost in all the serving, and you can get lost in all the right Bible studies and attending all sorts of other things, and being righteous and doing all these things. But at the end of the day, what Jesus cares about is that do you love His presence? Is all your serving coming from that? Are you like Joshua, the one that He loved? Are you like Moses, who loved being face to face with Him? Are you the Joshua who sits at the tent? Because it doesn't matter who walks in or walks out, but you love Him. And when you see giants, and when you see the impossibility, that when you face the fullness of fears, you say there is a greater love and a reality in that love than the fear that strikes at my heart. Because only then will you overcome those fears. Most of the parents in this world, the things that when you read articles about those parents who cannot have children, it's their greatest single fear. What if I cannot conceive? What if I cannot have my own children? What if I cannot give life when everyone else takes it for granted? I cannot do it. And I remember there was this family that I loved and cherished down at UVA. And we used to go to the farm. And they used to invite all the Korean you know, fellowship students to come and just spend some time with them. I remember the first time I went to this place called the farm. The Maxi Farm. And Mr. Maxi showed up, and he was a big, giant man. Just big. But in his eyes, you saw such kindness and grace. And I remember the first time I walked in, a freshman, and I was like, hi, Mr. Maxi. And he said, oh, who are you? And, you know, I was like, Bobby. And he, came, and he gave me this big hug, and he was like, oh. And I would always miss those hugs, because he would come, and he would just say, how are you doing? You want some venison? Because he would always go hunting and he would have like frozen venison and all sorts of things. His, all his kids hunted and things like that. Mrs. Maxi, the sweetest woman in the world, she would say, are you native Indian? Because I was really dark. <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm Korean. And you know, they couldn't have children. Their heart so broken. Everyone else was. 
greatest fear of their lives that they couldn't. And you know what they did? They adopted children from Korea. And so they brought us so that their kids could be exposed to the Korean culture and what we talked about, what we know. And so we would come to the farm and we would spend time with them. These children were so deeply loved. Orphans who were left by their parents who would never know what love is except for Mr. and Mrs. Maxie and they would be cherished above all. And they adopted not one, but four children. And I remember just sitting with them and loving and being loved by them. And I remember this is family. Mr. and Mrs. Maxine never, never treated any of his kids any different because they were not of the same race. But they were theirs, born of their heart. And they loved them. And lo and behold, Mr. and Mrs. Maxey, after adopting their fourth, they got pregnant when they could. And so was born this kid, Harry. He had blonde hair, blue eyes, the palest skin in the world. And then you see their family, and there's five of them, four Korean, and this one white kid that was like the blondest and white. Kid. And I was like, is he adopted? <laughs> Kid, right? And I was, because we were so used to these four Korean kids being part of the Maxis. We were like, these are their children. Who is this child? And why is he here? You see, they face their fears that maybe they will never have children. And they looked at God and said, give us the strength to make love conquer fear. And they did. What God says to every single one of us is this. There is so many things to fear in this world. People will break your heart. People will destroy your hopes. People will take away the one thing that God meant for you to have, hope. And you will fear stepping on people's feet. You will fear everything in your life. But God says this, let me be the foundation and the security of your heart. Let my perfect love cast out fear. <clears throat> Recently, there has been an event that once again places deep fear in everyone, just as events of 9-11. Just as everyone feared going on planes, because after 9-11, everyone was like, well, I don't want to die on a plane. And so the security measures increased. Now, people are second-guessing attending marathons. Everyone's like, oh, what could happen? And people are afraid of movie premieres, like maybe Iron Man 3, they're like, oh, remember what happened? I don't know. Maybe we'll go see a later show. A man who knows what this paralyzing fear can do to your heart is someone that I want to share about. He knows pain and suffering. He's, it's nothing new to this Costa Rican immigrant. The 52-year-old eldest son, 20 years old, Lance Corporal Alexander Arredondo of the U.S. Marine Corps. He died in action nine years ago. The day that he learned his elder son had been killed, which also happened to be the 44th birthday of Mr. Arredondo, he locked himself in a van, and with five gallons of gasoline and a propane torch, he set the van on fire. When he lost his son, a Marine, his heart on his birthday just died. And he said, I want to be with my son, so he torched his van. Though he survived, he was met with another tragedy. His second son, Brian, when he was 24, he committed suicide just before Christmas in 2011. When he learned that the final troops withdrew from the war which killed his own older brother, he was so depressed and so heartbroken 
that he killed himself, and so the father not only lost his oldest son, but his youngest son to depression. Brian has suffered with depression and battled drug addiction ever since Alexander, his older brother's death. And so now, this man, Carlos, he serves as an inspirational anti-war protester. Right or wrong, whatever it may be, for him, that is the only way that he found comfort. The people, they said in the article, they were waiting for the last of the National Guard runners representing Run for the Fallen Maine, an organization established to honor Marines who had been killed since the terror attacks of September 11, 2011, 2001. One of those runners had dedicated the race to Mr. Arredondo's son. Bowman, from Kelmsford, Massachusetts, had been watching his girlfriend compete in the race when the devastating blast went off, and it changed his life forever. Arredondo has described how, as most people ran for their lives when the explosions went off in Boston, he vaulted a fence to get to the spectator. When everyone else was running away from the bomb blast, he jumped over a fence to get to the people who were injured on the ground, many of whom had lost limbs and used his clothes. He took off his clothes to wrap up all the blood that was pouring out of the victims. I jumped the fence after the first explosion, and all I saw was a puddle of blood and people with lost limbs, he told ABC News. I saw adults much younger than myself, ladies, men, Pretty much everyone was knocked out. There was blood on the floor, blood everywhere. Then you saw, all you saw were ribs everywhere. I mean everywhere. The device, the IED, went down and then it went off. Mr. Arredondo immediately sprinted into action after the bombs detonated. And he can be seen in a series of photos and videos after, during the aftermath, rushing to one of the two bombing sites then pulling debris and fencing away from the bloody victims, clearing the way for emergency personnel to tend to their wounds. The thing is this, no one knew how many bombs there were. No one knew if there were going to be more that went off afterwards, but he didn't care. The first one went off and he went to the site. Mr. Arredondo helped Mr. Bowman into a wheelchair. He was the guy who had lost both of his legs and his femoral artery, artery was bleeding out. He would be dead within a short time, minutes, because he would bleed out so fast. And Carlos reached in and he grabbed the femoral artery by hand and stopped the bleeding. He picked him up and put him in a wheelchair. And you can see pictures where he's holding the femoral artery with his cowboy hat going down on a wheelchair. He said that I kept talking to him. I kept saying, stay with me. Stay with me. He's a member of the Red Cross disaster team. There's a graphic photograph that shows him with the severed legs, him holding the artery. Mr. Arredondo is not a hero because he is stronger in emotion than others. He has suffered and seen pain more than any man should ever endure. His heart, afraid probably of losing the ones that he loves the most because he has faced all of it. Why is it that the man who should be most afraid would charge into saved lives that had nothing to do with him? Because in his soul, he knows what it feels like to lose a loved one. The man that he helped, that he held that, his artery, he was only 27, close to the age that his son would have been. Because he would have known what the family, the girlfriend, would have went through if that man died. And he would rush in to save them. It is not because we are not afraid that we go towards the things that we fear. It is when love overcomes, when love is a greater reality than the fear that takes hold of our hearts. My question to you and I is this. As we go forward as a church, you and I can choose to be afraid of the things 
in this world that are terrible. We will face many people in our church who will go through the most devastating things. And either we can face it and run away and just try to put some band-aids, or as a church we can say, let's let perfect love cast out fear. Let's pray. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says this. Look unto Jesus, the founder and perfecter of your faith, who for the joy before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus didn't fear the cross because his love for us would be far greater than the fear of the pain and the shame. It is possible that after the most devastating event that you will begin to heal, that you will be able to conquer your deepest fears if you are captured by the perfect love that is described in the Word of God. Or you can live for the rest of your life always afraid, always afraid that you're not going to be loved, always afraid that you're not going to have what you've always longed for. Mr. Maxey, he passed away. It was sudden, and the entire family was so devastated. And I still write on the walls of all the Maxi kids, and I still try to encourage them. And I, every anniversary of his death, we write, and we say, this is how I remember Mr. Maxi. But I know this. I know that one day, I'm going to see Mr. Maxi, and I'm going to get my hug when I get to see him in heaven. Because more than the way that he loved his family, Mr. Maxey loved Christ. He loved Christ and he breathed Christ and his family and his kids knew that his father loved Christ. He conquered all fears. So I would say, let's be a church that lets perfect love cast out fear. Let's pray. <laughs>